Good evening and welcome to the Corporate Scrutiny Committee meeting of Tamworth Borough Council on the 8th of December. Uh, I'd just like to remind all members that the meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube. We've had apologies tonight from Councillors Simon Goodall and Councillor Sam Smith and everybody else is here. Uh, item 2, minutes. The minutes of the previous meeting held on the 17th of November 2022 are here for approval. Can I request a mover and a seconder please? So moved by John Harper, seconded by Michelle Cook. All those in favour? Thank you very much. Uh, declarations of interest, please can I ask whether there are any to be declared? I'm assuming not. No. Uh, no update from me. Uh, responses to reports of the Corporate Screening Committee. Nothing specific to report, just to note that the QPR report and our feedback went to Cabinet on the 1st of December. There have been no matters referred to us by Cabinet or Council, other than one item which is in the working group later on. So that takes us to the main item which is the asset management strategy. We have Assistant Director for Assets Paul Weston and Councillor Marie Bailey, Portfolio Holder for Finance, Risk and Customer Services. So I'll hand over to you two to lead on that please. Yep, thank you Chair. Uh, it's been a while since I came to the last committee meeting on this one. Uh, since then, uh, we've now got ourselves into a position where we've got a, a final draft asset management strategy. I think when I came last time, we were in the throes of preparing this based on some work we'd done around uh, a gap analysis of previous documents we held. Uh, alongside the documents that you've got in front of you on the asset management strategy, we've also got some updated uh, policies around acquisitions, disposals, and the the outline i suppose of the development of asset management plans for our individual assets so like i say we're at a point now where we have the final draft document or the, the one that we see as final draft document it's been reviewed by the asset management asset strategy steering group uh, which is a group that sort of sits that looks at a wider sort of asset uh, strategy. So that's not just building assets, it's around financial assets and investments and stuff like that as well. Uh, but that group looks at uh, the asset management strategy. Uh, the view is that if approved or if, if agreed with this committee with any amendments, uh, that this would be looking to take to cabinet in January 2023 for formal adoption. Uh, at which point then we'll implement and start to develop those asset management plans into working plans for individual units. Uh, as I said, sort of, I think, you know, probably fully aware of what the asset management strategy is there to do. It's around looking at the assets we own, uh, which are considerable with a, a relatively high value, but also a relatively high investment requirement. Uh, we have a number of commercial assets uh, or investment assets as we the, the classified as which are there to generate an income for the council we have operational assets which are for you know, conducting council business and then we have our heritage assets such as the castle uh, which are there sort of you know we're custodians of those buildings uh, for tamworth and for the public so it covers all of those aspects uh, i think as with any document of this nature it will never cover everything as in depth as you know perhaps it could do uh, which is where i suppose those asset management plans come into play because that'll look at more at those individual properties in isolation so obviously you've got the report in front of you that sort of just sets it out in terms of the sort of what we're proposing really the asset management stra strategy document is a five-year document because things change over time i think you know Probably current current times, things have changed quite rapidly, particularly around things like uh, building costs. So it's something that would need reviewing on a regular basis to take into account sort of the current situation, current market situation, and our current financial position. So really, we're looking at this sort of probably it says 2022 to 27, but it's going to be really realistically 2023 to 28 now by the time it's adopted. Uh, it picks up sort of the, the key priorities, I suppose, why, you know, how our assets fit in with our corporate priorities. Uh, again, that's our corporate priorities are as they are at the moment. As we review the document going forward, that could change to reflect whatever new corporate uh, priorities we may have going into the future. It sets out the categorization of the property, so operational heritage investment. Uh, the housing stock is included within this one. Previously, housing was sort of it sat aside the, uh, the asset management strategy 
but it's actually included in there now uh, because we do need to sort of look at that as as well as that wider picture of our asset base and in particular things like what we're investing in, why we're investing in it, potentials for disposals, growth of the stock and those sorts of things and that all of those will get picked up in there. Uh, covers on the, the investment portfolio so again we've got a couple of different types of investment portfolio we've got some ground rent properties where we own the land but not the buildings and we just generate a rent from those and then we have our sort of more commercial offerings so shops and industrial units uh, covers sort of just general management stuff around sort of rent reviews enforcing tenancy uh, arrangements to sort of make sure that we're we're getting the best out of the assets and having to invest only what we should be investing in those properties uh, and making sure that tenants where they have repairing obligations are actually fulfilling those obligations on the housing side it's probably a little bit you know more developed in terms of stuff that we've already been doing because we've got an investment plan uh, we've got a 30-year business plan for housing uh, again that's under review at the moment that feeds into this uh, because clearly that sort of sets the available monies to invest in our property. Uh, there's a breakdown of sort of the portfolios, the, the number of buildings, their value to us, and that's based on the most recent uh, asset valuations, the income that we generate for those, uh, and then the revenue expenditures, and also sort of picks up the investment requirements over the 30 year period. Pick up some key challenges in there. I mean, obviously at the moment, a big one is the inflationary costs on building and repairs, uh, which is significant. Uh, I think, you know, Tina was here last at the last meeting talking about the challenges faced on the housing side and the investment in housing. So there are, there are challenges there with the available budgets. Climate change and zero carbon will also be a challenge for us because again, it's going to require sort of significant investment to achieve our aims and objectives. As I said, what we what we'll look at now is on the back of this. This is a strategic level document. On the back of it, you'll have sort of more operational asset management plans, and that will look at individual units or groups of units where where appropriate, and it will sort of split them into certain categories and. That will be based on sort of their financial performance, investment requirements, and, the, and those type of things to sort of really assess their viability going forward. As a general rule, anything that's sort of you know performing well, financially viable in demand, you don't touch. You just you keep those because they're generating an investment, and that's fine. If it's in the red, so it's poorly performing, there's no demand or requires high investment. We need to look at those in a bit more detail uh, because those could be for disposal, it could be for regeneration, uh, it may be that you know we decide we want to keep them for strategic reasons or you know political reasons, but those those get a closer look uh, in, in terms of you know a bit more detailed look at them. And then in the in the middle of those you've got those amber properties that are marginal, you know, they could go either way. So again, generally what you look to do on those is look at what's required, look what the issues are with them, and you either try to move them up into green or down into red. So they either have a bit of investment, they become green because they're, they're, they're viable for you, or actually they drop down into red because it, they're not worth keeping, or you know it's difficult to make them viable. And at that point then, we can start looking at sort of developing sort of those more sort of planned elements around, so what are we gonna do with those properties? Now, some of that will be a business decision, uh, and some will be political decision uh, and you know and I think th there needs to be a route to go through around governance as to how we deal with that uh, appreciate that data is always going to be important to us uh, we've got stock condition data we need to update that on our housing stock because we generally do that every five years the stock condition data on our non-housing proper asset built assets is relatively recent uh, so that's that, that's another few years before that would need updating but it's important that we have that information because that feeds into that underlying financial planning IT systems we actually use now use the orchard housing system for all of our properties 
we're at, we were able to put our non-housing properties in there as well. So that and again allows us to monitor things like repairing uh, and investment in those properties. And we've also engaged services of a company to look at sort of the energy assessments of properties. Uh, high level stuff at the moment. So it's, you know, it, it's looking at sort of a, a, a global picture of our energy profile. Uh, that will give an indication as to the type of investment requirements and the type of expenditure required on our properties. Income wise, that's something we monitor on a regular basis. So, you know, that, that's an ongoing process of monitoring sort of the income, uh, again, just to ensure that they're actually viable. And all of that then feeds into that viability modeling that will sort of tell us whether or not these properties are viable. And if they're not, then decisions need to be made around what we do with them. As I said, we've now got a more robust disposals policy attached to this, uh, which again, we're looking to take that forward for approval at the same time. Uh, I think in the past, we have had a disposals policy, uh, but I don't think it was as comprehensive as it could have been. This does pick up a much more sort of comprehensive. Again, it won't cover every, eventu every eventuality because there will always be something that comes you know, comes from the side that we didn't expect to see, but I think it covers a lot more than the, the previous uh, disposals policy covered. And it will also allow us to look at things like disposal of housing assets where, you know, they're perhaps at a point where they're not worth investing in, and then how we actually reinvest that money back into the housing stock. So, you know, it, it will allow us to do a bit more with that one. Uh, you know, I think we recognise strategic partnerships are going to be important going forward and we need to look at how we might be able to use those to sort of leverage finance to improve our properties, in particular the sort of the, the commercial industrial property portfolio uh, and how we can work with external partners around that. Again, that's a piece of work that will need to be developed uh, because, you know, it's not something we've really done previously. The report sets out some key performance indicators uh, all the usual stuff really, you know, uh, income, you know, uh, expenditure requirements, uh, vacancies, th those type of things. And then usual risk assessment, uh, highlighting some of the sort of issues that, you know, we'll be facing going forward. And again, I suspect that will probably grow rather than shrink over time uh, because, you know, there's a lot of things sort of coming at us sort of that are largely outside of our control. Uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll have to sort of take those on as they come. Got the asset management, uh, asset management team in place. So that's, you know, uh, a team that sort of deal with both the housing and non-housing assets. And again, they'll form an intrinsic part of dealing with the implementation side of this. In terms of governance, it's... I suspect there will be the continued wide range governance on this. I don't think it's going to be a one size fits all governance. There is the asset strategy steering group who probably will have that oversight and sort of deal with the, I suppose the options appraisal side of things before anything goes anywhere else for uh, consideration. But clearly we've got uh, the house, the housing subcommittee scrutiny uh, committees and cabinet that would all be involved in the process, depending on what, what, you know, what level of acti activities going on and what level of inputs required. And then it just sets out some of the sort of, I suppose, the link strategies. And again, more than happy to take suggestions on that one if there's anything I've missed off there. I think those are the ones I could sort of think of when we were looking at, uh, looking at the strategies. But again, I'm sure those will grow. I think, you know, there's probably another couple on there that have come out of the woodwork in the last couple of days in terms of financing uh, that would probably sit in that as well. In a minute. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's going to be other stuff that sits in there. And then the next bit really is the acquisitions policy. We've, again, never really had a proper acquisitions policy uh, previously. We've had a broad policy around housing acquisitions uh, to deal with sort of acquiring properties on the market to spend our uh, right to buy capital receipts, but not for anything else. So again, this tries to cover as much as possible, but there will always be sort of exceptions to the rule that will come forward that you know we'll have to look at in isolation and based on its on its merits. But it tries to cover uh, as much as possible. So you know the routine stuff, 
strategic stuff. Uh, you know, sets out who who does what and where. But again, you know, there'll be a whole range of governance around that. And then, like I say, disposals policy really just sort of takes the old policy, picks up most of the stuff that was in there that, you know, we need to do and should be doing, but then really sort of, sort of expands on it, sort of make it a little bit wider, I suppose, and sort of picks up more of our approach and how we deal with things. Uh, and also the why we would want to dispose, because I don't think previously the policy really covered that in any detail. Uh, and hopefully what that will do is it will set out sort of to those people who quite often approach us about buying properties that clearly the policy is there and actually that's what we'll, we'll work to. Uh, but like I say, there will always be exceptions to the rule on that one. And, you know, so I think it covers, covers the most part what, what I think, what, again, what I think we need to cover on it. Uh, and it covers the various property types. There's also some statutory stuff in there that we have to do and, you know, uh, around consultations and certain uh, legislation around lease extensions and stuff like that that we have to comply with. So, it, But it does cover those to some degree, uh, but largely by reference in the legislation. And then the final bit really is just the sort of asset management plans. And this is really just a bit of a framework, I suppose, for how those plans will be developed and, you know, the process map around what goes into it how we look at it and what the outcomes are from it so again that will be developed and sort of used a bit more uh, mm -hmm. with the asset strategy steering group when we start looking at the viability modeling so the next piece of work for us now is if if approved or with amendments approved we'll be to start developing those asset management plans on properties and groups of properties uh, i think the asset strategy steering group will lead on that and it will be largely looking at what we need to look at first and why. The housing stuff will always sit there in the background because we're having to do that anyway as part of the HRA business planning. So that's that's going on in the background to one side. So I think a lot of it is going to be on the non-housing side where the asset strategy steering group will be looking at. Uh, and I suppose really it'll be just looking at, so what are our priorities around what we need to look at? And that could be driven by uh, I suppose to a large degree is going to be uh, driven by finances. So what what do we need to focus on and why? And I suspect finance is going to be a, a priority in there around sort of investment and return on, on investment for us as a local authority. So that, that sort of briefly outlines it. I mean, hopefully the report covers what you needed it to cover anyway, uh, but happy to take any feedback on it uh, through the chair. And like I say, if there are amendments, Happy to sort of look at those before it goes through to the cabinet process in January. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, great to see the progress on it since we last discussed it in here. Um, so I'll open it to the floor then. Do we have any questions from the group? Councillor Harper. <clears throat> thank you. Just uh, two points, if I can very briefly bring them up. Um, first one, um, uh, our council house stock... Um, I presume that we are still um, operating the right to buy um, system. Um, what's the take up on that? Is it, uh, have you any idea what the current um, number of properties basically are being taken out of um, the council stock? Uh, I don't have exact numbers, but uh, it's fairly. It's fairly low at the moment. I think it's around about 30 at the last count. With uh, budget for 50, yeah. yeah, it's it's fairly low at the moment compared to what it's been in the past for obvious reasons. I'm, I, 30 comes to comes to mind when I spoke, last spoke to someone on that one. So the actual housing stock itself is, is roughly around 4,000, is it? Uh, 4,200 and something. Of which 30-ish, between 30 and 50 are being sold off per annum. Yeah. Thank you very much. If I may, just very briefly, an another subject. When going through this report, excellent, uh, excellent uh, report. And uh, the one thing I felt I needed was um, a comprehensive list of the assets and properties that we have. I've not seen one. Does such a thing exist? And would it be possible for us to see it? 
the asset register the asset register is published on our website as part of our uh, open data. We have to we have to publish it annually, and it has to be updated annually. So it is available. More than happy to send you a copy, or just send you the link to it, so you can have a look at it for yourself. But it is there, and we like I say, and it has been for a good number of years now as part of that sort of uh, open data that we have to publish. Thank you. Please forgive me. I'm, I'm technology, and, and I are not great friends. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, over to Danny Cook was next. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, welcome the progress that's been made on this. Um, as we know, as a council, it's been a long time in coming. I noticed that, Paul, you said in your introduction, you know, finance will be the priority. As we've always known, finance isn't the priority, it's the bloody challenge. <laughs> um, I won't mention names, obviously, apart from one, but, you know, I've noticed for the last 15 years, um, people like Andrew Barrett, long before he was a director, never mind the uh, chief executive, was demanding an asset management strategy, whereas a lot of the finance guys who weren't with us were re rejecting it and refusing it and pushing it away because it would open up too many questions. And that's the complication you guys have been fighting for a long time, isn't it? Yep. Um, so that, that said, it, it's pl pleasing to see the progress made on this. I don't think it's quite there and ready yet, but we'll get through that this evening. There was a key word I couldn't find in here, and if I missed it, I'm happy to be proved wrong, but depreciation. Now, I understand that individual assets, when you get down to the individual strategies, so if, you know, for the castle or the assembly rooms, fair point, but you cannot write an asset strategy without ever using the word depreciation. Therefore, I think there's a major component of this strategy missing, which is how do we depreciate our assets? Because if we don't know how to depreciate our assets, our treasury management strategy doesn't work because we don't understand minimum revenue provision against the loans we've taken out on properties to depreciate the loan. There's so many missing links I can't quite ascertain from this strategy. Until I see some element of depreciation, I'm like, I don't understand how you can own an asset and not understand how you depreciate it. Whether it's a house, a castle, a lawnmower, a computer, it's got to be somehow depreciated for the sake of accounting and for sit for code of practice. So I'd certainly say this strategy isn't ready until there's an element of understanding our depreciation requirements within it. I mean, open that up to discussion if you're interested, Mr. Chairman. I've got more to go through, but to, to me, it's a, it's a major missing factor. Yeah, let's go, f go with that one first. Yeah, we'll... I mean, effectively, on an annual basis, we have to revalue all of our assets, and as part of that process for finalising our accounts, depreciation is taken into account as part of that accounting process. That will sit in with the asset management plans, so that's part of that financial uh, net framework that when we look at the financial viability of the properties, that gets fed into that piece of work there. So yeah, absolutely understand that, and I'm not saying we don't depreciate our assets correctly, because like I said, we couldn't set our treasury management strategy on the minimum revenue provision if we didn't. What I'm basically saying is, this is the overarching strategy that doesn't in any way, shape or form mention depreciation, which then says it's not an overarching strategy, it's just something that says point you at another document. I, I think we need to understand in the strategy itself, I mean we say it's in, on several terms in there, this is a transparent strategy, but yet there's a fundamental piece of it missing. I wouldn't be comfortable seeing this approved by Cabinet until we've got a reference to the depreciation and how we depreciate. I know we do it, and I know you do it very well, Paul, because otherwise yeah. we couldn't uh, conform to SIPA code of practice. I'd just like to see it somewhere in the strategy so it can be detailed, as it says, a transparent strategy. Thank you, Mr Chairman. OK, well, I've noted that down. We'll, when we come to recommendations at the end, we'll amendments. Um, Andy Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for your report, Paul. It was um, it's it's a very good report. I think it's a very it's it's a good overarching report. I definitely think there's things that need to be uh, fed into it, both specifically in assets, uh, an asset type, and and as uh, Councillor Cook just mentioned as well, other factors that may have been missed off. Um, I definitely think one of those factors, uh, especially in and around housing and some of our more um, uh, prestigious uh, assets such as the assembly rooms and the castle is uh, is definitely an age profile that's uh, that's linked to uh, a maintenance strategy plan so i think the housing um i definitely think that uh, we need to have a little bit more in there for housing with with how we're going to maintain our stock what's what's going to be expected of it because ultimately the maintenance of our housing helps us to keep compliant to a lot of um health and safety standards and ultimately, um, today's compliance is tomorrow's evidence. And so if we get that set out right, um, what, 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 what we're doing really is we're, we're sort of protecting ourselves as a council, um, whilst also providing a fantastic service for the, uh, for the local residents. Um, and to caveat that, I would say that 
actually the priority probably shouldn't be finances. It's a factor. It's not a priority. Priority should always be safety. Thank you. Come in there. Yeah, I mean, obviously, again, I think, you know, take, take on board the comments around the housing and the maintenance plan. That forms part of the stuff we're doing around the HRA business plan. So this references that. I suppose the issue there is <coughs> that's an ever-changing document and will change consistently. And we're expecting further change when the housing regulator starts ramping up their side of things. So I think we just need to be careful around how detailed we go into that in this document at this stage, because I suspect that will be a completely separate piece of work that sits somewhere else that says, to achieve this standard, we need to do this. So this is more a reference back to that, that says we, we have a maintenance plan for housing that's part of that HRA business plan and reference back to that, because that then allows for that to change without sort of, I suppose, that overarching document having to change too much. So, you know, they'll reference across to each other. Take on board your comments about sort of the, the finance. I mean, I think really, I'm talking predominantly around our investment portfolio when I'm talking about the, the finances, the other properties, uh, place like the castle, the assembly rooms. Well, clearly, you know, they, they are heritage assets that we are custodians of. So the, the financial side of it in terms of them being a financially viable asset that, you know, that is only there to serve a financial benefit doesn't apply to those. But we do hold some stock that is only there for that investment purpose. And realistically, if it's not showing a uh, return on investment, we probably shouldn't classify it as investment property uh, because you know it's not actually generating that profit. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, thanks, Paul. Um, I think, yeah, I, th I think I do agree with you with regards to the overarching document uh, with referencing an, uh, the other strategy, the HRA. However, I do think that uh, when it comes down to the granular detail of how we manage our asset in regards to housing, I definitely would like to see a little bit more detail in that with what our current maintenance plan look like for for the housing and, and all the other assets. Really, I mean some. That, that there may be a few assets there that we say well we, we don't maintain um, or we do but it's on a minimal basis but I definitely think with our housing stock when, when you drop down to that next level of, of individual buildings and uh, building categories we need to get into that level of detail whereby okay we have a document that says this but what are we going to do because essentially the document should probably just be the bare minimum that we deliver we might want to deliver a little bit more on certain things so it's about that breakdown I think at that, at that next level Jim Thank you very much. Councillor Michelle Cook. Thank you. Um, I've got four points that I just wanted to go through, if that's OK. <coughs> so, yeah, the first one, um, you've got about the... Where is it? In the main um, asset management strategy, you've got about the value of the assets are about 28 million, and you currently get about 1.7 million return on those so it's working out from my kind of awful maths about six percent return are we anticipating that to continue at around six percent for the next five years or have we got any estimates of impacts with what's going on i think at the moment that's quite a difficult one in terms of industrial in terms of industrial property that seems to be quite strong at the moment uh you know the market seems to be quite strong on that Retail, as we know, hasn't been particularly strong. Uh, with that said, most of our retail on our housing estates has generally done okay. And I think that's largely because it's small scale. It tends to serve that small local community. And those shops are scaled very much for that purpose. Uh, ground rents tend to be fairly static because of the nature of them. So in that sense, it probably is, but obviously we have some large uh, investment portfolio uh, properties that we know will struggle because of the current market conditions and they are a risk to us. So you know, I, I wouldn't want to say that could continue at that rate because I think there are some quite large, large grain rents that could be a problem for us going forwards. No, thanks for that, Paul. I think it's just really important to maximise that income as much as possible and having this strategy does at least give us that opportunity to be far more targeted potentially or 
going forward than historically. So yeah, that's really useful. Um, one thing that isn't mentioned apart from about um, looking at potentially selling land off to vulnerable adults or things that could be used for, the word vulnerability is not used at all in the strategy. And considering it picks up, uh, yeah, it, it, in fact, it picks up social housing and the fact that kind of things like decent home standards are in there, I think it's really important that we kind of reflect that priority throughout um, that or at least make reference to how we're going to be working on it. Um, there is another section that sort of goes back to kind of what I was saying on kind of vulnerability, but the section on page seven, where it's got climate change is high on the government's agenda with the, with the climate emergency having been declared in Staffordshire. It would be nice to see within this that we've declared one in Tamworth as well. I don't think it detracts from saying so. However, when you carry on within kind of the actual document, it's got, um, if I may chair, just so I get to kind of the right point, the council has already committed to achieving zero carbon across its own activities, which will require investment in operational heritage and leisure premises, as well as common parts of housing properties. Um, it is anticipated that housing standards will change with further emphasis on energy efficiency and there will be a demand for energy efficient business premises. That reads as though we won't be making investment relating to carbon net zero in our housing stock. And I recognise that right to buy is not included in this, but I would have expected to have seen things like changes to boilers and bits and pieces like so included within this. And is there a reason why it's not reference specifically. Yeah, no, th thank you, Dr. Councillor Cook. Yeah, I mean, basically that is purely referencing our zero carbon commitment. So the, the document as it stands at the moment only addresses those activities where we have direct control over them uh, because what it recognises is that whilst almost certainly housing standards will change and require greater investment in zero uh, energy efficiency, we don't have direct control over those properties and the activities within those properties. So that is purely a reference to the overarching zero carbon strategy, not anything else. So that's why it's referenced there. There will be different standards for housing, but we don't control housing in terms of what people do in their houses. So that's why it's excluded from that. So it does reference the investment, but it excluded specifically from the zero carbon commitment as an authority. Okay, thanks for that clarification. I still would challenge that back to say that whilst we have no control whatsoever over what someone does in terms of their day-to-day -day living, we are the people for anyone that's got a social property, that we are the ones that do bathrooms, we're the ones that do kitchens, we're the ones that do roofs, we're the ones that do boiler replacements. And at some point, there is going to be a requirement for us to actually consider if we're, if we're generally, as an authority, want to become zero, zero carbon, we are the ones that have to set a strategy of saying we're going to invest in that. And I recognise within the policy that it says that a lot of this means that we will not get a return on it because there isn't a return. It's about do we want to meet those objectives that we all sat here a few years ago and said we did. So the fact that's not in there, I think, that needs to change before it goes to cabinet. And I've got one more question, if that's okay. Um, and then going on to the disposals policy, um, just a kind of, well, I suppose, where it's got about disposals up to 10,000 pounds wouldn't be necessarily, should we say, or if there wasn't a market value for them, so to speak. Um, if people approach us, we will sell them off, or potentially or open into negotiations. Do we actually have any plans to do some sort of fire sale and saying this is what's available that's under that or anything similar um, from maximising income, reducing liability? And the other side of it is if somebody does approach us saying, I'd like to buy that little bit of verge or something similar, do we just negotiate with that individual or do we go to neighbours to say, we're looking at selling this, the current market offers £6,000, does anyone want to give us more for it? And if so, could we? If we want to truly income generate, thank you. 
Yeah, no, thank, thanks for that one. In, in terms of disposal, we're not actively looking to dispose of those small plots of land, uh, largely because the, the actual, I suppose, the cost of doing that and the cost of managing that, it probably exceeds the valued return for it. Uh, it's quite a labour-intensive piece of work uh, when we do get those coming in. Uh, but we recognise that you know we do get approached from time to time on this. In terms of individual plots, when people approach us, we have a pragmatic approach to that. So yes, if if a plot of land would be seen as having multiple interested parties, then yes, we we have to talk to those parties because for no other reason we know that if we only talk to one person then the neighbours will soon come and knock on our door anyway. So we might as well have those conversations up front. But an awful lot of these pieces of land, really, there could only be one interested party because it adjoins a single property. So really, on those, it's a small piece of land that has no real value to anyone else other than that person as a bit of an extension to their garden. Uh, so it really does become a negotiation with that person because there's no one else really to negotiate with. But we take it on a case-by-case -case basis and we do have them where, yeah, there are multiple interested parties. What we try not to do is go into a bidding war over it, you know, it's because that doesn't always work. Very often what happens is you end up splitting up a piece of land so that, you know, a couple of people can extend their garden rather than sort of just one person extending around the back of someone else, which doesn't really work for us. So, but we just take that on a case-by-case -case basis, which, you know, I think will always be the way we have to work with that because there's no one size fits all. Thanks, Paul. I, I suppose I, I would sort of challenge about the fact that it's sometimes more cost effective not to advertise than it is to advertise because you never know what someone's going to be interested in. If you put it out, people might actually want to pay more for it. And if we are genuinely looking at income generation, then I think we, sh we should. Um, I suppose the one thing that potentially might be an addition to this as a strategy then, before that, should we say, the final version, is actually putting some sort of case studies into it so that people that are reading it, especially if you are looking at acquiring a, prop or a piece of land or something similar, actually having some, in this circumstance, this is what we would do. Actually just give people a little bit more information in an easy, understandable way rather than having to trace through a big document that would just be a, from my comms side just looking at something like that to add to it for the final versions but otherwise that's the end of my questions thank you very much chair okay thank you just taking some notes here councillor Danny Cook yeah thank you Mr Chairman sorry one of follow on from the other councillor Cook um, not that councillor Cook that councillor Cook so this councillor Cook following on <laughs> Yeah, always spoiling it. Yeah, just the small parcels one I also had noted down. Um, um, for want of a better term, Paul, me and you have butted heads over this one for many, many years. A uh, perfect example, there's a little, tiny little grass verge at the end of a street. Cars are parking on it, litter is always on it. You know, so a guy that lives on the house right next to it that doesn't affect another house says to the council, can I buy that bit of land, put my wall around it, and I'll take care of it. And our stock answer is always no. And as you rightly say, because the effort you, your team, would go through to then sell it to that person for pulling it out of the air two grand, compared to the legality I mean, you put into it, actually then says it's not worth going through the process. Well, actually, that's a very silo mentality because we mow that grass, we litter pick that grass, we do everything else that involved. So actually, as an authority, I would argue that we're not looking big enough in that circumstance to say that is a small piece of grass verge that is of no use to this council or the county council or anybody. That actually, this person is saying, I will look after it. And that, to me, is a perfect piece of disposal. And I think we actually need to reverse our policy of instant no there to actually, how do we say yes without upsetting all the neighbours? Yeah, case by case basis. And if there's three neighbours and they all might want it, it's a bit more common. But if it's a straightforward, this is a solid, obvious thing in the world, our stock answer should be, how do we en enable this? Get it off the council's asset. It's no longer our problem. But that neighbour then will take care of it, put their wall around it, extend their garden. I dealt with one a few years ago where the father had a disabled child and wanted a bigger garden. There was a grass verge at the back that the council didn't take, take care of. No other neighbour could access it. The rigmarole I went through to try and get the council to sell that to that person to extend his garden for his disabled son was unbelievable, and it was such an obvious answer to me. So, yeah, I just wanted to comment on that. I actually think we need to relook at mm -hmm. small parcels of land. Actually, how do we get to saying yes rather than saying no when it's of no strategic value to this council? But my actual question, Mr Chairman, was this. 
This um, asset strategy, uh, strategy, obviously, as Councillor Cook has alluded to earlier, it does mention the current vision. And the asset strategy is in place to a degree to meet the current vision. But since the state of the borough debate, the vision is under question. Now, the vision as it currently stands, and again, I've said it, no real problem with what the vision was trying to achieve, is very much an economic vision of how do we improve town, how do we improve the town centre, how do we drive things on, how do we create greater employment opportunity, how do we do education. It was a very much an economic vision, which is great in itself. Now, what was raised at the state of the borough, and we got a unanimous vote there, was it missed out the vulnerability side of society, certainly during the cost of living crisis. Now, what I mean by that is things that are currently not shown in the vision is words like vulnerable, like homelessness, like mental health. It's key components that society needs to look at, and assets can help deliver on those functions. So if this vision fundamentally changes with the review it's currently going through, and we know officers are putting some effort into that review, it could change how we look at our assets. Therefore, are we in danger of setting a strategy that we might have to forcibly change in two, three months? And I'll give you a perfect example. If you look on page five, on paragraph four, which references our HRA properties, the housing, the final part of it mentions, you know, how we deliver versus the vision is important in this element of asset management. But the vision may change in two months severely as we do that piece of wide review of what does society actually need for us. My fear is if this goes to cabinet in January slash early February, we might have to rip it up and change it again. I would ask that this is paused until that piece of work is done to ensure we're not missing something. Because certainly from an HRA perspective, if the vision isn't ca capturing vulnerability, the HRA is a key component to capturing vulnerability, it's social housing. So we're in real danger of missing a trick here. So I would ask for a delay until that piece of work is done. I hope I made sense there, Mr Chairman. Yeah. I want to come in there, Maria or Paul? If I can come in on the first comment around small parcels of land, at the moment, the policy is no snow sales. Obviously, this is a new disposals policy, so we can look at those. I think, you know, in terms of maintenance and ongoing maintenance of land, that we do consult with uh, colleagues in street scene uh, on those, and, you know, there are issues there. What tends to happen is, in fact, when we start getting into the costs of those pieces of land, very quickly people decide they don't want to buy them uh, because they don't want to actually pay for it. What they really want is just for us to sort of say, there you go, put your fence around that piece of land. So that that's a challenge we do have, which is why I say, you know, historically it's been a problem for us in terms of an awful amount of effort goes into those initial discussions. And as soon as you start talking price, people back away a little bit on it. So that, that has been an issue for us. But as I say, the current policy is we don't sell those small pieces of land. So that's, you know, that's something that, you know, in the current, in the new policy, that can change because it does allow us to look at it, in, you know, on its own merits. Uh, in terms of pausing and the vision, obviously that I think is a political decision. Uh, so I, you know, I'll take steer on that one, uh, you know, because clearly, it, yes, it is written around the current vision because that's what we've got at the moment and that's what we're working to at the moment. Uh, I would anticipate that any policy will have to change as our corporate priorities and vision changes. That seems to me that's just the norm for how policies work. So, but, but if it's imminent, but we shouldn't set ourselves up for it. Yeah, I mean, if it's imminent, then so, so be it. But I, you know, again, I don't know how far that's progressing and where we are with that one. So I'll I'll take steer and guidance on that one. Okay, thank you. I've taken notes on that, uh, Councillor Harper. Yeah, I've listened uh, very uh, intently to that. Um, on, on the parcels of land issue, um, yeah, I think personally that the, the current position is the correct one, whereby we treat every case on its own merits. There is always a case whereby small parcels of land do actually benefit the whole of the community because um, they are green or they've got grass on them or trees on them or whatever. And there's the, always the threat that when someone buys them, they're going to tarmac them and put a car or whatever it is on them. And that, that piece of greenery is lost to the whole community. So I think we have to be aware that these parcels of land can sometimes contribute to the general uh, well-being of everyone rather than uh, just selling them off for whatever reason. And I think, uh, I think we're doing the right thing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harper. Anybody else? Can I just people?
Thanks. Um, hopefully, these will be brief and practical comments. Um, the first one is, and I might have missed something, but on the on Appendix A on the actual draft strategy, it refers to three appendices, which I don't think we've been provided with. Not, not at this time. Those will be in the document. This is purely just sort of draft Okay, thank you. And then um, on Appendix C, the draft disposal strategy, I was just looking at part three, and I'm... I'm looking at this only on uh, electronically, so I don't know whether my page numbering's right, but it looks to me like page 15 of 17. Um, it talks about impact on the community, and specifically, it, it, it largely focuses on protected characteristics. But the way that it's written um, is all about uh, the impact of disposal on that particular group. So, you know, well, sorry, let me push it another way. The opportunity to acquire rather than the impact of disposal. And actually, that doesn't seem right to me because we should be looking at what's the impact of groups within our community on our decisions to dispose of property. Um, so th this doesn't read to me correctly because it's basically saying there's virtually no impact on, our, on anybody of our disposals policy unless they're either a child or mentally incapable of buying property. And that's actually not really what we should be considering. It's what's the impact on people within our community of disposing of, of assets. So just as a, as a comment. Um, and finally, Chair, um, I, I, can't, I fundamentally can't agree with uh, this policy because right at the very, very beginning of it, uh, it sets out reasons for holding assets. And the second one is to generate income. And I think I've made my position very clear over recent months and years that I don't think it's our job to be generating income by holding assets. I think if we hold assets, we should be using them for the people of the borough. It's just a comment. Is, so is generating income for the council not supporting the council and, and the borough? <laughs> I suppose just playing devil's advocate here. Um, it, in my view, it's not our job to generate income by holding assets. We should be. We can generate income by um, taxation and also by grants from government. But holding assets in order to generate income strikes me as the wrong balance. But I know that I'm in the minority on that. Okay. So, <clears throat> unless we've got any more questions, I thought we have. Okay, go on. Yeah, I think a lot of mine have been asked by other people. I'm just um, getting to, I think potentially this is more for when we get to one of the working groups, but it's just a question I want to ask. Uh, on page eight, uh, where we discuss HRA stock conditions data, Chris Cook will like this one. Uh, housing property was last surveyed in 2018 with approximately 20% of properties physically inspected and the remainder being cloned to give an accuracy of 91 to 99%. So when we send out letters to leaseholders basically saying we're going to come and fix your roofs, there's a chance we've not actually looked at these houses, we've just cloned it from other property data. Is that what that's saying? Potentially. Ouch. Uh, we'll get back to that, if you don't mind, when we get to the actual working group. That, that scares me fundamentally. Understand why it's done, but it does scare me fundamentally. Uh, yeah, um, just as we joked earlier, Paul, just when you say linked strategies on page 16, obviously uh, vision, um, tourism. The one I thought you really missed was health and safety. <laughs> uh, so yeah but like you say you know there's more to add in reset and recovery town centre strategy and communications but uh, the only other comment i might make is obviously on appendix b uh, page 10 where it says stakeholders it currently says tamworth residents and tamworth businesses i think we can expand that out quite a bit as well because i would argue most assets would have to answer to highways in some way and there is other things you know other stakeholders or the police the you know other emergency services i think just consigning ourselves to stakeholders when we talk about assets to you know businesses and residents there's so many more out there any physical asset will have to somehow access the highway at some point so highways have got to be part of the discussion so for argument's sake if we took a building in the middle of a housing estate we'd say we turn it into a youth club i think the police and highways would want to know because the additional foot traffic etc et so i think there are more stakeholders we need to look at other than that i think most of mine have been asked mr chairman so I'd certainly you know, like to see us move the motions, as I'm sure you're writing down, that depreciation 
um, takes place about this. There is a further review of how we do disposals, and obviously we delay until we fully understand where the vision is. That's where I'd be looking for this. I think it's a fantastic starting point, but I do think there's some things missing. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Michelle Cook, you put your hand up. Is that it was. It was just actually a follow-on. I mean, you know, when you read something and then don't necessarily read it 100... I was not saying properly, yes, properly, but you didn't notice me. It was what um, Councillor People said about the um, Part 3 impacts on the community form. The fact we're, we're clearly referencing, effectively, what the Equality Act 2010 said in terms of the protected characteristics. Can we just actually change that to... Because um, the actual question is, thinking about each of the areas below, does, does or could the policy function or service have a direct impact on them? And it was like, well, actually, can't we just drop the word them and actually say anyone that's protected by the Equality Act's protected characteristics? Because and it's, cause it, that's what basically all of them, apart from, I'll say, children, vulnerable adults, which isn't under protected characteristics, but it's within the Equality Act. Can we just change it slightly? Because... Sorry, go on. <laughs> Sorry, people go on. You can jump in there. <laughs> uh, only because there are some groups listed there that aren't covered by the Equality Act. So yeah. just maybe it's better to keep them, you know, to, to list yeah. them separately. I don't know. Yeah. Or just, or maybe we actually just actually put it down because I know an awful lot of organisations say that if it, if it's something like vulnerable adults, vulnerable people, well, we have to from a safeguarding perspective. So actually just referencing where the policies that comes from rather than just kind of a big long list of does it, are any of these groups affected if so yes and is anyone else in the community affected was just a point thank you and that was it uh you can if you want to yeah yeah t take on board what you said that was probably something we need to raise through corporate management team because that's the standard uh, community impact assessment document that goes on all policies so it's the standard that we use for everything at the moment so if you do want change to that I think it's more than just this document it's across the whole suite of uh, policies and everything else we do I would give one hell of a piece of work <laughs> <laughs> um, so I tried to note things down as you've been speaking and I I'd, I'd propose that we've I think there's about eight key things we've discussed. I'll go through them one by one and see if we think that is something we want to propose or not. Yeah. So the first one, and I don't know if that don't know if it's answered or not, but um we, we talked about the comprehensive asset register list and there's a link to it but it's not in the report. Do we want that adding in explicitly to the report to for it to be complete? If you've got to call it transparent, yes. You, you, well, yeah, if, you, if you're reading the re my view, if you're repeat, reading it in isolation, you're not going to know. You see what I mean? Like John, Councillor Harper. I think, I think if, it's, if it's readily available online, provide the link. But to, to provide a list of God knows how many assets. That's in what I mean, asset. the link? Yeah, so, so the, the link is fine. I think a comprehensive list inside the actual report would be no, a little no. bit overkill. Just reference that it exists in the link so yeah. that someone can... Yeah, that's a, that's a fair comment. All in agreement on that one? Yeah. Do we need to vote individually? Or can we go with nodding heads? Yeah, I think that's... We just need to list them out. And, and there's one record at the end. Okay, so add. I've got that. Yeah. Okay. Everyone in favour of that? Anyone against? No. Good. Uh, next one, we had... Um, add depreciation into the strategy explicitly. So where you reference that you do this valuation each year, and it's kind of... Everyone should know that. We should put it in explicitly, which I think Councillor Cook's referencing. Is that right? Yeah. Just to understand how we do it, you can't list in the strategy for every asset we have because the, the individual asset management plan for that property, but there needs to be reference to depreciation in an asset strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone in favour of that? Anyone against? No? Okay. Um, next was... Again, if the wording's wrong, correct me, but basically adding in uh, safe, safety and housing maintenance plan into the strategy. I'm looking to you, Councillor Cooper. Something along those lines. Yeah. Yeah, so but I, think, I think there needs to definitely be a separate set, a section in there about maintenance, even if it's to uh, reference um, 
certain different documents, but I, I definitely think we need a, a maintenance strategy, a strategy. No, no, no viable asset management plan uh, goes without a maintenance strategy. Okay, we got that. Clear enough. I have a section about maintenance. Yep. Everyone in favour? Anyone against? No. Good. Uh, next one. Um, I've reworded about four times here. So basically just um, to reference vulnerable people and the impact of wider, the wider community in the strategy. And we can either have this together or decouple it and to consider um, either delaying that or there's a review of the re vision or reviewing post X months after the vision. See what I'm trying to do there, trying to put the two together. Uh, just to um, basically pause the actual uh, approval of the strategy until we've done that piece of revision work on, on the revision on the vision, revision on the vision, uh, to make sure that we're not missing a trick because if the vision is setting to degree our asset strategy, we need to ensure the vision is right and that we're actually picking up those vulnerable comments. Okay. So would we make it consider um, on, council people? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Unfortunately, um, due to the, the change date, I wasn't able to make the State of Tamworth debate. And uh, so I have a question on whether there is actually a formal review of the, the, the mission, the vision. That, that's actually going on at the moment, is it? Yeah. OK, thanks. OK, so should we, should we put that as a recommendation? Consider delaying the report until after the review of the vision so that there isn't that nothing is missed that yeah. Everyone in favour of that? Anyone against? You're frowning? You against? Are you? So we're not tying hands, we can we, we consider. It's I don't actually think that the vision should be included in asset management strategy because I think most assets outlast most councils. And so I think it probably needs to be um, agnostic of any sort of political speech because it's an asset management plan, not not a vehicle to, you know what I mean, it's to deliver ideology. I don't know. That, that, that's my thoughts on it anyway. That's why I'm against. Councillor Cook. So, sorry, Councillor, we've got to fundamentally disagree with you. The way Tamworth Borough Council functions under legislation is simply this. You set a vision, you set a bunch of corporate priorities, through that you set action plans, through that you set your budget, right? So that drops the departmental business plans that deliver the things the council does. Everything the council does has to work back to the vision under legislation unless it's actually statutory, right? The vision will set out what this council believes it should be doing over the next few years. That's why it's the corporate plan. The vision becomes the corporate plan. So corporately, the big decisions these officers will take, whether it's on assets, finance, will all reference, we're trying to achieve the vision. If the asset strategy isn't trying to achieve the vision of the council, then it isn't doing anything according to the corporate priorities. It has to, the vision sets out what we're trying to achieve as a council. These, it, how we use these assets will be used to meet the vision, whether it's to create income, to pay for the policies and the staff to deliver certain parts, whether it's a building we particularly want to use for vulnerability or mental health, it all falls from how the vision sets out those corporate priorities to meet the corporate plan. And if we can't do that using the assets, I don't understand what we're doing. We've, we've, we've got to use our assets, assets to meet our ambitions as a council. Our ambitions as a, as a council are the vision, otherwise it's pointless having a vision. That, that's how a council functions. Yeah, we have a lot of documents referenced in there that we have no control over. But I, I think we, let's let's agree to disagree. I, I'm not I'm not going to I'm not going to agree to that. Uh, so let, let's let's agree to disagree. Okay, so we're all happy. So we're generally happy with the word so it's consider. So we're not saying it, you know, dictating it has to be done, but we can consider well, it in line with the vision. Yeah, it. but we're using that wording. Yeah. All those in favour? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Next one, consider referencing, again, improve my wording here, right? Consider adding uh, reference to zero carbon investment into the asset management strategy. Is that something we want to propose or add in? I think a reference to it, certainly. Go on.
Anyone against that being added in as a recommendation? No. One of it was a, a, an idea which I tend to like, which is adding a, a couple of examples slash scenarios to sort of bring the, the document to life and what would happen uh, in certain scenarios. Do we want that in? Councillor Cooper? No, not for me. <laughs> Just, no, because it, mo most of the stuff that we're going to be talking about is set on an ind individual case-by-case -case basis, even coming down to the fact of selling a little bit of land that's on the end of a park. So how can we, you know, I don't know. Uh, what, why do we need scenarios in there to understand some of the, some of the wording? That's a Chris Cook. Let's get a mic. <laughs> Um, I've got to say rather yes on that, not because of the way it is, but we have a document which is also on our website. So who, whoever's actually kind of reading that document, we it, it don't kind of know how easy it is uh, for For them um, to understand it, um, you know, I mean, obviously, anyone can read a document, but if you did, don't understand what it's actually on about, then that's when you, you have an issue. So, as an example, if there are um, just uh, more examples of if if this was a uh, situation, this is what would happen. This would be um, our outcome, etc. Then just kind of reading that would uh, would actually help them understand a bit more. Uh, so, but I actually reckon that I mean you just. To have a uh, couple of those in there, so we would like to really help it out as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think there's often documents are written with an assumption that the reader understands it, and there's loads of acronyms and everything in there. So yeah, Councillor Cook, Michelle Cook. Thanks. I think yeah, just to kind of follow on from what Councillor Cook just said there as well. The average reading age in the UK <coughs> is seven. It's a really highly complicated document and anything that we can do to make it more accessible and more open for residents to be able to read it and access it, that was my kind of reason why I suggested it. And I mean, even things like you just mentioned there about acronyms, Councillor Cook, things like having a glossary in there with the key terms, those things to make it accessible, because this is one document. I'd like to think the public look at all of it. But if you're potentially looking at acquiring a piece of land, then actually you're going to read those documents. So it, that it's just a small little thing just to make it a bit more open. Thank you. Yeah, Councillor Cooper. I think I agree with the, with the list of definitions and abbreviations and what, what we seem to make acronyms for, for the sake of making acronyms nine times out of ten. Um, However, I think that this is an overarching document uh, that Paul has already said there will be a lot of feed documents into it. I think I'd be more open to having specific examples in those um, further documents that feed into it. So it, if you look at the overarching document and it, it, it then links you to, and you know, you, you're thinking about buying, buying, buying your house, say, um, and then you, you want to sort of go through it, then you get hyperlinked to the, the housing bit that's a housing strategy, and in there would be that scenario that's based on housing, you know, tenant A would buy their house and this is the process. I, trying to bog this document down with various different scenarios that it may or may not reference is um, would 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 greatly enlarge this document it could potentially anyway because this document um, with it being an overarching document touches on so many different things that feed into the asset management plan I, th I think it, that that's for further on down the the process Paul what, what do you think on that one 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would tend to agree. This is a strategic document. It's not an operational, uh, you know, a ma an operations manual. Uh, and I think certainly what we tend to have is those operational documents, the process maps uh, and procedures tend to sit under the strategic documents. So that's more of a procedural issue uh, around the process of how would you buy it? And to be perfectly honest with you, I, I'm not sure that that sits as a, a document as such. It's more of a bit of a process map and some examples on the website that says, if you want to buy a piece of land, this is what you need to do and this is what you can expect from us. Uh, and it becomes more of a, you know, just a procedure manual or a guide, you know, a quick guide to people because you're not, people won't read this as a document unless we probably say no to someone on a sale and then they'll refer back to it and say, but your policy says, uh, really what they want is that simple, can I buy this piece of land and how do I go about it? Uh, not at the moment because our policy, our current policies, we don't sell small pots of plots of land. So there would be a fundamental shift if we're going to start looking at saying, actually the default position is yes, unless it shouldn't be, then that becomes a different piece of work. So we would have to do those guides for it. At the moment, what tends to happen is people ask the question, default position is usually no, but if we get into the point where actually sale makes sense, then we actually work with them and talk through it on a one-to-one -one basis because every piece of land and every sort of situation is so different that it tends to work better that way. Uh, and you can actually sort of de explore sort of the detail of it at, at that point when someone's engaging with us. So, look at Michelle here. So do we think that was is, could be potentially a better way of doing it? So consider uh, process guides where relevant for scenarios found in the commander strategy, something like that. I think adding that as a recommendation to say that if that's a change in policy, then we actually, before this goes live, we actually have proper documentation that is available for people to support the introduction. Happy for that amendment. But I would still say, could we put a glossary into the original documents? Thanks. Okay, comes the people. Be, yeah. Just wanna... I was just going to say, Chair, that you'd made the um, proposal, so perhaps we should vote on it. But, uh, I mean, I'm all in favour of, of anything that makes things more straightforward and understandable. So, um, Okay. So I think it was just to get the wording kind of right, what we were saying, because so, these were just rough notes in GP's handwriting on here. Um, so I think we're saying add in a glossary of terms and abbreviations into the document and consider sort of how-to guides for any changes for those customer facing. We don't necessarily have to submit it into this document, we just have to be yes. with people. Want. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We all in agreement on that one? Yeah. Cool. Oh, Good. <laughs> uh, then there's two more. I think this was one whether the council should consider a more open and proactive policy for smaller land purchase inquiries. Still case by case basis, but be, be more aligned to let's think about how we can say yes rather than yes. Order. Default position always been no. no. And if their residence gives up there, that, that's the end of it. Yeah. It shouldn't be a default, no, it should be case by case basis. Okay, council people. We, at the moment, as I understand it, always insist that anybody who's purchasing land pays the legal costs. Um, I don't know whether there's any um, mechanism for them paying the administrative costs as well, which would help to solve the problem that you've got there, Paul, in terms of spending a lot of time on, on things. I'm sure that there must be a way of doing it. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Again, I'm probably waffling slightly, but if you think when a developer comes to us to talk about um, a planning application, we can charge them a fee for coming to talk to us. So there is an, an opportunity potentially to do something similar to say, if you want to come and talk to us about buying a house or not buying a house, buying a plot of land, then actually, depending on the value, there is a 1% fee or something similar to, co to co contribute towards it. At least so, have a look at it and see if it's something you could do. Yeah, so I think if we can, if we if we propose that as a recommendation, that the work then to look at what it looks like would, would come after. So we, we all in agreement on that? Anyone against? No. Good. And then the last one uh, was to expand the stakeholder list. Um, I think. Yeah, just to really think who the stakeholders really are. Yeah. 
Yeah, I did spot that one, but I forgot to mention it. Uh, Councillor Cook beat me to it. But no, absolutely. The stakeholder list being two is not a very uh, c concisive stakeholder list. There are a lot more. Yeah, I mean, you've got you know you've got charities, you've got different authorities, you've got a hell of a lot. That 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 list should be quite extensive. Uh, uh, maybe not across the board for every single asset, but if we're going to list a stakeholder list inside an overarching document, it needs to be quite a long list. Yep. Just following on from that, there's a section in there on partnerships, and I noticed that that was quite unspecific, and I think it would be helpful if there were some indicative um, partnerships mentioned. And again, it's the same sort of lines, isn't it? It's the county council, the police, fire service, um, voluntary sector, all sorts of, of different people that we might be in partnership with. Okay, thank you. So everyone, no one's against that, right? No. Okay, thank you. So that was. Can I just make one yeah, point? sure. So one I forgot to raise. I'm not specifically looking for a recommendation. I'm just going to suggest to the portfolio and the office it might be worth a clarification in the wording. Obviously, you're right. It is an overarching document, but as Council Cut raises, you know, public, by a chance, somebody may read it. You know, they do pay for it. They do own it. Um, obviously, when we say at the very first start of it, you know, this is a transparent document. Yes, it is as an overarching strategy. Asset management can never be truly transparent. Perfect example, if we wanted to sell Marmy and House next week, we might know, and I'm making these figures up, we might know as a council it's worth two million quid. If you go to the market and say it's two million quid, somebody's gonna offer you two million quid. As we discovered with the golf course, when you don't give the market a value, somebody will pay what they think it's worth and we made a lot more money. So there's times when asset management can't be transparent. I just think it's some, maybe worth a reference to the commercial side of asset management in there, just as maybe an added paragraph to, there will be times when the council can't be fully transparent because of the nature of maximising the value to the taxpayer. You know the wording better than me, Paul. But it's not a recommendation as such, it's just a, a suggestion. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So <clears throat> the report had some recommendations, which is basically that we review the contents of the strategy and accompanying documents, so we've done that. And uh, it says here, approve the asset management strategy and accompanying documents for presentation to Cabinet. I think we just amend that to say with the following uh, amendments, recommendations from scrutiny. We've got eight, which we just listed. Yeah. Yeah? With the following eight. Do we need to move and second that? On, on block? Can we can have a mover on block for that? Councillor Chris Cook and a seconder, Councillor Michelle Cook. All those in favour? Yep, good. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul and Councillor Bailey. Thank you very much. Um, next item eight, we had uh, rev two working groups. First one's a QPR, and I'll just chase again. Anyone's in the working group? I sent an email asking for some initial thoughts. If I could get those by email, and then we can work out how we need to progress from there. So we can try and get that this side of Christmas, and then we get a meeting in the in for January or something. Because ideally, we'd propose something in February, maybe March. The last meeting's March, which we have nothing for at the moment. So it might be we we get some changes made in February to pr pr bring back here in March. But I'd like to do it before the end of the municipal year anyway. Uh, and the next one was the review of leaseholder charges communications working group. Any update on that from that group? Just to say that uh, Mr. Weston has sent us a nice long um, email of lots of things. Um, so we just need to convene another meeting to progress that one. So hoping to get that in the diary again, hopefully before the end of this year. Okay. And thank, thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Forward plan, does anyone have any item on the forward plan they would like to add to our work plan? I didn't see anything new. No. Cool. Uh, then we have the action, log and work plan. Um, the only one to note really is the assure update is added to work plan for February and March. That was an action that's done. Um, currently for the February meeting we've got three items, which is the QPR report for Q3. Potentially the working group on QPR, if we get that in time, and then the regulation social housing for council zone stock coming back, which we talked about. Was it last meeting or the week meeting before? Um, does anyone have any comments on that? Are you happy with that at the moment as a draft agenda? Yeah? I was like, fun, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> 
Great, well thank you very much. I thought that was a good meeting, got some good recommendations in and uh, it's now 7.15, I close the meeting. Thank you very much.